guys, King Lockerfeld here, back with another video reaction. And today we're gonna to be doing a Mr. Ballin video. This one is, this must be the worst way to die. Top three places you can't go and people who went there anyway. I mean, that's how you end up on a Mr. Ballin video. I mean, <laughs> if you're not supposed to go somewhere, don't go. But I mean, that that's what makes these videos interesting. So we'll find out um, these top three stories and see what happened. I, I'm, I'm interested in figuring out like who who had the worst death like on this on this video. It sounds pretty um disturbing, but let's go ahead and get into this Mr. Ballin video and see what happens. <laughs> let's go ahead. Today we're going to look at three places you can't go and people who went there anyways. But of course, to those stories, people just if can't listen. Of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once a week. So, if that's of interest to you, please sneak into the like button's house in the middle of the night and burn several bags of microwave popcorn. Also, please subscribe to our we'll channel do. and turn on all <laughs> notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Digging sounds. That, that already On sounds February 15, disturbing. 2004, two police officers drove down a quiet street in a little English village called Murrow, and they pulled over in front of this little brick bungalow. Earlier that day, a neighbor who lived on the street had called the police to report hearing a strange digging sound coming from inside of this bungalow. And so these officers had been sent out to see what the sound was and make sure the occupants of this home were okay. Now, these two officers were not particularly worried about the occupants of this house. They assumed that some wild animal must have snuck in while the owners were away, and that was all this was. But I mean, would quickly that learn, sounds pretty that concerning. The case. <laughs> After climbing out of their car, the two officers just stopped and listened for a second to see if they could hear this digging sound. But the bungalow was quiet, the street was quiet, and so the two officers shut their car doors and made their way up to the front porch of this bungalow and knocked on the front door. After a few moments, when nobody answered, one of the officers reached down. Maybe somebody's like trapped inside. Found like it was unlocked, and so he opened the, the door just a in crack, the and attic or something. Out through this opening in the door into the bungalow, saying, "Hey, you know, it's police. We're here to check on you." But when no one called back to them, the officer opened the door the rest of the way, and immediately both officers saw there was a huge problem inside of this house. The entire first floor was flooded with several inches of water. What? And they could hear from somewhere from in the back of the property the sound of running water. And so again, both officers called so, out into this house to try to get the attention of anyone who did somebody like die in the bathtub and when, or something. Again, they were met with silence. The officers walked into the flooded house and began walking straight back towards this running water sound. Mm. And eventually, I would be afraid of what I'm of what room, I'm going to see. They entered this hallway. <laughs> I would not want right to go any the further. The property, and as soon as they were in it, they could see there was an open door at the end of the hallway on the left, and it seemed like the running water sound was coming out of that room. And so the two officers, one by one, sloshed down this hallway to this room. They turned left, looked inside, and what they saw completely shocked them and immediately sprung them into action. Two months before these officers came to this bungalow and found it flooded with water, Whoa. the owner of this bungalow, So this bungalow, happened two months ago? Ronald McLeagish had broken up with his girlfriend. And this breakup was really hard on Ronald. He was already divorced. He was totally broke. He had loads of health issues Dang. like bad asthma. He had some liver issues. It's... And just generally, he was someone who was kind of physically frail. And so this wow. girlfriend had been one life of the very few has been rough to him. in his life. And now she was gone and he was alone again. And uh, so very quickly after this breakup, Ronald fell into a very dark depression. Uh, and so I can imagine. six weeks after they broke up, Ronald, for the most part, just stayed in bed and kind of moped around his bungalow, kind of feeling bad for himself. But then finally, at the end of those first six weeks after the breakup, Ronald decided he wanted to get his life back together and just move on. So on February 1st, 2004, so roughly two weeks before those two officers would come to his bungalow because of this digging sound, Ronald would wake up feeling determined to start anew. And the first thing he was going to do was purge his bungalow of anything that was his ex-girlfriend's. She left a lot of things behind. I mean, that's a good idea. She had not collected you them. You gotta start so somewhere. They were just kind of sources of pain. 
and where most of her stuff was inside of Ronald's bungalow was in this closet in one of the well, bedrooms. Well, why didn't she come back and get her stuff? So didn't she move morning, out? Ronald headed down the hall. He turned left into the bedroom. He opened up the closet. He went inside and with a trash bag in hand, he began rifling through everything in this closet and anything that was hers, he would take it and put it right into the trash bag. And at some point, when Ronald was almost done pulling the last few things of his girlfriends out and into the trash bag, from behind him, he heard this strange sound coming from the bedroom. It sounded like wood bending or creaking. But Is somebody before he in the turn house? around to see what the sound was, the door to the closet he was in slammed shut oh. with incredible force. And suddenly, Ronald Wait, was somebody trapped in the inside house? of this closet in total darkness. Now, Ronald was likely what? shocked at first, but he would have reached and tried for the handle and found that no matter what he did, he could not open this closet again. And oh, so no. Ronald I'll, began screaming. No, I would have started kicking the door, but kicking, nobody pushing. came to help him. The closet that Ronald was in was fairly tall, uh, but it was only two feet wide by about two feet deep, which meant Ronald could only stand inside of this closet. He oh my down, goodness. I would, no, down. I would. He literally was trapped. Yeah, no, I would find Ronald a way. He didn't have water. He didn't have food. I would, he knew I would find that a no way. No one was going to be checking on him anytime soon. And even though his bungalow was kind of small and shabby, it was built out of brick. And so the likelihood that his calls for help oh were my goodness. outside I mean, <laughs> loud enough What else that can go wrong in his life? And that they would come in and rescue oh. him was pretty slim. And so at some point that evening, Ronald realized he needed to do something different if he was going to get out of this closet. And so above him were a series of pipes across the ceiling. And so he reached oh, up and he grabbed one of them that's... and he broke it off. It, it was he a was water like pipe. That with this oh. pipe, maybe he can he drown? a hole in the wall and crawl through to another room, or maybe he can punch a hole in the door and somehow unlock it, or at a minimum, with the metal pipe, smashing it against the wall or the door would be louder than any noise he could make by yelling. However, the second he broke that pipe off water. the ceiling, something horrible happened. The pipe he broke was a water pipe. And as soon as it was broken, icy cold water began pouring down directly Ooh. on top of Ronald's head and face. And again, because he can only stand basically in the middle of this closet, he couldn't get out of the way of this water. It was like he was under a waterfall and couldn't go anywhere. Wow. And so he likely tried to ignore the water and tried to use the pipe and screamed and do anything he could to get someone to know he was in here, but no one could hear him. And so it was like he was being tortured with this freezing water and he's in this tight claustrophobic space it's total darkness and he's totally panicking and for days and days that would days be Ronald's of, oh. nightmarish reality and, and, but despite how terrible his circumstances were Ronald continued to use that pipe to both smash the walls to make loud sounds. He also began burrowing into the walls, trying to make a hole. But Ronald I mean, was going to be a way out. You have to, he became very like, sick. And also, because the water was constantly hitting his head and face, his skin got so saturated that literally his skin started falling oh, off. And basically oh, opened up into the oh, sores oh, oh. and began to sag, and the water just began brushing his skin oh, off. Oh my so goodness. Finally, after about a can't get out at all in this closet like, in these terrible conditions ronald realized like, was wait, not what? Going how to did he get locked in and like so this like pipe down he kind what of kind of closet is this wall and then closed his eyes ronald's neighbor who called the police actually did hear Ronald using that pipe to try to dig a hole in his wall and she heard Ronald smashing the pipe on then the why didn't you call the cops? She must have heard muffled shrieks and yells but she didn't know what they were <laughs> and kind of just decided it wasn't her business but when Ronald's house went from all these strange sounds to silence that was when she called the police and said oh, hey I after had heard he dies. some digging okay. sounds <laughs> coming from the bungalow. Let's call the cops and after. And so after when this, those two police yeah, officers arrived that at made Ronald's sense. bungalow, they went inside, they went down the hallway, they went into the bedroom where Ronald had gone, and they saw this huge wardrobe, which is a big wooden piece of furniture, toppled over right in front of the closet. And at the bottom of the closet, they saw two human feet protruding from underneath that little space at the bottom of the closet. <laughs> those feet belonged to Ronald. He had managed 
managed to force his feet underneath the closet, but of course, he could not have fit underneath the closet door. And so the two police officers rushed over and together, they barely were able to get this wardrobe off of the closet door. And okay, so I'm guessing up, that Ronald it was fell. In there, he was deceased, his uh, body of course. was still in a standing position, kind of rigid and propped up against the wall, and freezing water was still pouring down onto his head. It would turn out no wow. one had intentionally that, that trapped is really sad. Instead, his wardrobe fell was over. just unstable, and it happened to topple oh over my at goodness. the worst possible moment. That is so unfortunate. Oh my god. Shattered glass. On Thanksgiving morning in 1900, an 18-year-old named Thomas Pedler told his mother that he was going out for a bit, but he'd be back in time for turkey that afternoon. And then he grabbed his jacket and his coat and he headed out the door. Thomas lived in a very working class neighborhood in San Francisco, California, where oh God, generally looks, speaking, nothing so... big really ever happened. It was kind of a place oh. where people just worked and that was it. But on this day, something huge was happening in Thomas's neighborhood. The big football game between Stanford University and the University of California was taking place at the stadium in Thomas's district, and they were expecting over 20,000 people to cram into oh the God. stadium. And so Thomas <laughs> was not about to miss this incredible spectacle, even though he didn't have enough money to buy a ticket. But he knew he would find a way to watch this game. And so Thomas leaves his house and he runs to the stadium, which was not far from his house, and he waited in front of the front gate where all these people are streaming in to go into the stadium. And around 11 a.m., Thomas's very close friend, Charles, who was also a young man, made his way to the front oh. gate. The two met up. And at <laughs> first, their plan was to try to sneak in with the horde of people that were making their way into the stadium. But even though I mean, I'm sure nobody would know this from the opening kickoff of this big game. It was at 2.30 p.m. The stadium was packed. I mean, there was nowhere to sit. There was nowhere to stand. People that had tickets who were going in are looking around thinking, you know, where are we going to watch this game? And so Thomas it's and crazy Charles that people, were kind of like, people well, used to dress up to go to sneaking in sport games, nowhere to watch. And so they, they decided, okay, and we need to find another way to watch this game. And so they began looking around and they noticed there was a huge fence that lined the perimeter of the stadium. And they saw there were some people kind of climbed up on this fence trying to get a view down onto the field. And pretty quickly, when Thomas and Charles decided they would try to do that too, they saw that all the good spots on this fence were already taken. The spots that were open provided no view onto the field. And so that option as well didn't work. And so Thomas and Charles are frustrated. They're starting to worry that they will not see this big game. But when they walked back over to the front gates of the stadium, they happened to notice across the street was this group of people rushing over to this big white brick factory building. Oh, here they we were go. literally placing ladders up against the sides of this building and beginning to climb up it. I mean, this is a five story building and they are just basically free climbing the windows and the fire escapes. And Thomas and Charles Bad idea. that- I'm sure Sure. of this factory was flat and provided a perfect view down onto the field. And so all these people, they're trying to get a good seat to watch this game. And so without any hesitation, Thomas and Charles decide they're going to do that too. So they left the stadium. So they, they, they went anyway. The street, and they began climbing up the ladders and climbing the windows and the fire escapes until finally they made it onto the roof, 55 feet off the ground. And when they got up there, there wasn't that many people. And so Thomas and Charles were able to run right over to the front edge of this building and claim a spot with an absolutely perfect view of the game. A couple of hours later at 2.30 p.m. when the game actually started, the rooftop that Thomas and Charles were on was now completely packed with people. Hundreds of people have climbed up onto this factory. There this were is some a bad idea. Below, this is telling people that roof is going to cave this. or, or something. Do not on top of this factory. It's not safe. But nobody listened to them, and the police either didn't notice this was happening or they didn't care. And so there's all these people that are on this roof. They're all super excited. And the game has begun. It's 2.30. And as soon as the game started, it was like the crowd in the stadium, which could be heard very easily from this rooftop, just kind of erupted. And there were all these bands playing in the stadium. I mean, it was chaos down below. And it really caught on on the roof. All these guys, including Thomas and Charles, they're getting amped about this game. They're singing. They're chanting. They're screaming. They're yelling. I mean, it's total chaos. And Thomas, <laughs> and Charles loved it. 
But about 20 minutes into the game, as Thomas and Charles are enjoying themselves and the crowd is still going wild, a dull cracking sound oh. could be heard coming from one side of Get the down. Roof. And so Thomas now. and Charles, they kind of spun around to see where this cracking sound had come Who from. Who cares? And when Get they down. Began looking out I don't care where it's coming from. People, <laughs> they noticed on the far side of Let, the roof where the sound had yeah, come let's from. Yeah, let's get off. They could see people scrambling to get off the roof. But before yeah, smart Thomas and people. Charles and the other people around them who were watching this happening could figure out what was going on, there was a much louder cracking sound. And suddenly, the floor underneath Thomas, Charles, oh, and everybody else. Oh my goodness. Collapsed. And immediately, people on this roof fell all the way to the bottom of this oh. factory, 55 feet below. Ooh. There weren't loads of floors inside of this factory. Instead, it was basically just one big building, 55 feet high, that housed this brick structure right in the center of the factory that was almost as tall as the entire factory. It was almost like the factory was a shell around this brick smaller structure right in the middle that was like 40 feet tall. And so after the ceiling collapses, mm -hmm. Thomas, he falls, but miraculously, he lands on a wooden beam that stretched across the entire factory, like a support okay. beam, and he grabbed onto it, saving himself from falling all the way down. And so Thomas, he only fell maybe five feet, so he was okay, okay but he not didn't that have bad. a great grip on this beam. He was holding on. Well, you better but get a good barely. grip. And so Thomas, <laughs> he turns and he's looking around at what's happened below him, and he's hearing people People screaming and he's hearing the sounds of people running around trying to help those who have hit the ground on the bottom and Thomas immediately begins scanning for Charles and he finds him Charles was one of the other fairly lucky people at least in Thomas's mind Charles seemed lucky because instead of falling from the roof all the way to the ground Charles he fell and on the, 15 the or structure. 20 people had fallen okay. right onto that brick structure okay. that kind of made up the main part of this factory. And so Charles had only fallen maybe 10 or 15 feet onto this structure. And so Thomas is thinking, oh, Charles and these other people, they've survived this fall. They're okay. However, the second Charles and the others who supposedly were saved by landing on oh, this brick what structure, happened? the second they hit that brick structure, despite not suffering catastrophic injuries like broken bones and horrible internal injuries, these people on the brick structure began letting out these primal screams, these just horrible what? blood curdling screams. And as they did, these loud popping sounds began coming out oh. of their body. Oh. And then their, their bodies body. began contorting forward, almost like a bug rolling up onto itself. Why? It would turn out this factory <laughs> was not a normal factory. This was a glass factory, and in order to make glass, you need to heat sand and some other chemicals Are you up serious? to extraordinarily high temperatures. Whoa. You need a furnace that can literally burn hotter than lava. And so that brick structure that was housed oh, in the middle wow. of this five-story tall factory so was a glass so furnace. So they're burning up. And it was on. And so even though the inside of this furnace was the hottest place, it was over 4,000 so degrees Fahrenheit, wow. the outside so just on of top. this furnace where Charles Burning and the up. others had landed, wow. believing they were saved from this 55 foot fall to their death, was still extremely hot, so hot, that the factory workers couldn't even go near the furnace, even with special equipment on. The way they worked with I would the rather hit the ground than these burn up. Metal pokers. They would work the flames and the glass at a distance. Hey, and I so thought they, the I thought instant they were lucky. That Charles and the others landed on the top of this furnace, they began to light on fire. Those snapping sounds that were coming oh out of their bodies goodness. was the sound wow. of them instantly igniting on fire. And so Thomas and the others Dang who had initially up. survived this horrible collapse collapse, watched as Charles and the others shrieked and shrieked, and their bodies continued to contort, and they continued to burn and smolder, and Charles actually, he would roll up so tightly that his body began to roll down the curved side of this furnace, and at Are some point, serious? his body slipped into a crack in the furnace, and he actually fell into oh. the flames inside, at which point he went silent. Uh, Around I'm the sure time that Charles and the oh. others stopped shrieking, a number of people just just out what? on the road, Ow. heard the commotion, and they came inside, and one of them was Thomas's father. And in a terrible twist of fate, 
he actually looked up and saw his son clinging to the beam, Thomas, except it was so hot inside of this factory that Thomas was sweating, he was losing his grip, it was really hard to hold on to this beam, and his father watched as Thomas lost his grip and fell the wow. 10 more feet down onto the furnace exterior. He landed feet first, then he fell So his dad had to watch space. him he die? He ignited on fire, began shrieking, and then went silent. All told, 23 people would be killed that during is this nuts. collapse. Oh my and God. And dozens and dozens that more is crazy. would be horribly injured and disfigured. This collapse goes down as one of the very worst disasters in sports history. However, on this day, the crowd inside the stadium was so caught up in the game that they actually didn't notice this horrible tragedy taking place just a hundred feet away from where they were. It wasn't until the end of the game when the winning team's fans carried their players in this kind of spontaneous parade out of the stadium to celebrate that they walked out onto the street and saw all these burnt up, rolled up corpses of the people who had landed on the furnace. That is wild. That, that is terrible. Oh my goodness. In April of 1979, oh. a 69-year-old woman named Monica Myers was appointed mayor of a little village called Betterton in the U.S. state of Maryland. Betterton used to be this very fancy resort town on the water where people from Baltimore and Philadelphia would come there for vacations. They had fancy hotels and restaurants and shops. But by the time Monica became Betterton's mayor, Betterton had kind of gone downhill. People had stopped coming to Betterton. All the hotels shut down or were abandoned or burned down. The summer homes of the rich people from the big cities, those got sold off. And down at the beach, all these glamorous boardwalks literally just kind of crumbled into the sea. And in their place were all these shanty towns where homeless people set up their camps. But Monica had Whoa. grown up in Betterton. And so she really loved the town and wanted to improve it. And so when she became mayor in 1979, she really leaned into her new role way more than other mayors would. Instead of managing well, the village from an office like most mayors would do, Monica literally went out in town and just began doing lots of jobs around the town for free. She would ride around with the police and literally stop crimes in action. One time oh she stopped across <laughs> someone looting a vacant hotel and she personally got out, chased this person down Lady. and made them put everything what? back that they had taken. Oh. She would pick up trash on the beach. She would oh, do okay. random repairs on people's homes oh. and businesses she all just over let town. the cops and do their job. She would I would just say. go door to door asking people how they were doing. And so very quickly, the people- I mean, but it's nice that she really, really did to care. love Monica and they loved seeing her every That's single rare. day just <laughs> out and about making Betterton a better place. And so on March 20th, 1980, roughly one year into Monica's tenure as mayor, it was immediately noticeable to the people of Betterton when Monica was nowhere to be seen. That day, she did not go to the police station in the morning like she normally oh. did. She was not seen at the beach doing her trash Wait, pickup. Where and are she you, did Monica? Not on anybody's door. And so by mid morning that day, the people of Betterton, all 120 of them, were basically out in the 120? That's it? For Monica. And at 11 30 so a.m., so a small the town. police in Betterton got a call about Monica. It was this guy who was totally panicked. He could barely make a sentence. And he basically just told the police, you gotta get here now. And so the police hopped in their cars and they sped to the address this guy gave them. And when they got there, they saw it was this very plain boxy building that was kind of tucked back in the woods. It was far away from the town center and really nobody ever went over here. And the police, when they parked their cars, they saw the guy who had called the police, the distraught caller, was standing outside of the front door. He was obviously crying and he was waving for them to come over and follow him into this building. And so Dude, what happened? The cars, what? They ran over to this guy and they're asking him, you know, Why what is happened? he crying? Like, Monica, what happened? On? But this guy was so hysterical, he really could not describe what happened to Monica. He just kept telling them to come on, come on, follow me. And so he led them Dude, into it must this be building, terrible. And pretty like... quickly they entered this huge warehouse where all across the ceiling were these big metal catwalk areas that kind of zigged and zagged 
all over this warehouse. And below them, all over the floor, were these huge industrial sized 15 foot tall vats that contained something. And so this guy who had led police here, he stops and he Is just it, points um, at the nearest acid? vat. And so the police picking up his like, did she cue, fall into and acid or something or this like... vat. And as they got closer and closer, they were hit with this horrible smell that made them gag and cough. And before long, they had to stop and kind of compose themselves. The smell was so bad. It would turn out this building that was kind of removed from the town center of Betterton was Betterton's sewage treatment plant. And that morning, Monica had gone to the treatment plant to help clean some of these 15 foot tall industrial sized vats that contained human waste. She had done this enough times that when she was here, she did not um, need any supervision. And so that morning, why, why, she was alone, why, why, she climbed why, why, up onto one of the catwalks why, why would you do that? these big vats, and she had reached down with her testing kit oh to God, test the sewage no. to see how much cleaning it would please need. Please don't tell me she... And as she did that, no. she somehow slipped and fell into the big oh vat. Oh my goodness, waste. no. Now, oh. she would not have immediately gone under. It was not like a liquid. It was more like clay or really thick oh. mud, where at first, she would have kind of been laying on top of the sewage. That but is so... She tried to move to get out of the what? sewage. The sewage would have functioned more like quicksand, where as soon as a part of her body went under the surface, it would not come up again. And so, after the police composed themselves, they Are climbed you? up onto the catwalk. No, and they looked that, that down is and they saw that Monica, is so who was face down, partially face. submerged inside of this vat, and she was deceased. Her autopsy would reveal that she died of drowning, which means she literally inhaled human waste. <coughs> No, you are not serious. No, she did not. She drowned in human waste. Okay, no. Out of <laughs> I'm out of all three stories, that has to be the one that has to be the one that was in the title. The the worst way to die. Can you imagine falling into human waste and then absorbing it? absorbing it into your mouth and into your lungs and oh oh my god no that is so disgusting oh my goodness i can't believe that one no i cannot believe that one that was that's beyond disgusting like i can only imagine what her last moments of life felt like just taking the human waste okay I mean, all all three deaths in this um in this episode were tragic, but no, that one took the cake. That no, that that's disgusting. <laughs> um, but you know, rest in peace to her and everybody on the list. But yeah, that that's just indescribable. But yeah, the the first story that was pretty sad. I mean, I don't know. It just it, it was only a closet. It just felt like maybe there maybe there was a way he could have got out. I don't even I don't know exactly what the answer would be, but I mean, it, I don't know. It's like I, I would have tried to. I know it was like like a small closet, but I would have tried to kick or something. Or I, I don't know. And I'm, I'm not trying to blame him for his own death because you know, if, if there was no way out, there was there was no way out. I don't know that for sure. But yeah, so that one was tragic. And then the second story extra tragic but i mean also preventable because i mean when you see hundreds of people on the roof i mean i'm not gonna join them because clearly something's gonna happen there's gonna be like a collapse or somebody's gonna fall off or something like that so you know still tragic i mean especially with them falling inside and burning up on the, the glass furnace that was just um ridiculous um so yeah and you know the third story like i said just that was just disgusting. I mean, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, accidents happen. That that was just a really unfortunate accident. But anyway, guys, um, that's how we get these Mr. Ballin videos. You know, people do stuff that they're not supposed to. Accidents happening. That that's just life, I guess. But anyway, guys, a very entertaining, informative episode by Mr. Ballin. Let me know what you guys thought about this down in the comments below. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Until next time, be blessed. Be your best. I keep down the stress. Bye, guys.